So this was suggested to me as, um, as, as a seminar subject. Um, I'm talking about digital isn't straightforward digital and go into some of the reasons why digital isn't straightforward. Um, and uh, it's a new seminar for me. I only wrote this a few days ago, so I hope it, it goes well. Um, but we'll see. So um, I thought I'd start this off by talking about some audiophile myths. Um, digital cables and sources cannot change sound quality because it's all bit perfect digital data, assuming it's bit perfect, of course. Except that, of course, they can. Toslink Optical is generally considered as being the worst sounding digital connection. But in my opinion, it's actually the, the best connection. And I can give for technical reasons why it's the best, best connection and why people, um, when they listen to optical and, and don't like it, why they don't like it and what, what's actually going on there. My next myth is the most contentious one. And it's the one issue that, that I have the most difficulty with. Linear power supplies. Um, linear power supplies has got this religious further about them that they must be better than switch mode power supplies. Except that linear power supplies in reality are nonlinear in that they create distortions. So we're talking about that as well. And then finally, uh, a completely non-contentious discussion point about passive components and um, why that they measure perfectly in some cases. A lot of cases, passive components don't measure perfectly, but a lot of passive components measure perfectly, but they still change the sound quality. So I'll be talking about why, why that can happen. And then at the end, we'll have question and answers, and I'm free to talk about this seminar, and if we've got time, we can talk about anything else. So, digital cables and sources can sound different, even though you've got bit perfect digital data going into the DAC. Why is this the case? Um, so, there are three issues that can change the sound in the sound, uh, sound quality of the DAC. The first one is jitter. Um, which everyone's familiar about. Second one is random RF noise, creating noise form modulation inside the DAC. Um, and that's, that's an issue that has a particular sound quality signature. And the third one is correlated RF noise. Um, correlated means it, it bears some resemblance to your music signal. And that has a different effect in terms of sound quality. So jitter, this is an uncertainty in clock timing. Um, and if the recover clock from the source is used for your master clock, it will have a big bearing on sound quality. Um, simply because your master clock is your source clock. Um, it may go through an analog face lock loop, but an analog face lock loop itself creates jitter and it will never totally eliminate jitter from the source. Cables can add jitter by adding noise. Um, and in fact, any logic level change will create extra, extra jitter. So as a rule of thumb, when um, a clock signal goes through a logic gate, you get an extra one picoseconds worth of, of, of jitter. You know, that's just a, a physical reality of, of it. Um, different sources will have different jitter levels. However, with my DACs, um, jitter is simply not an issue. And the reason it's not an issue is because there's something called a digital phase lock loop built inside the, the DAC. And this digital phase lock loop measures the incoming frequency creates a brand new word clock that is locked to the local phase lock loop, sorry, local master clock, low jitter master clock. And so the source clock isn't being used at all. RF noise. Um, this is a major, major problem 
within DAX. In fact, random RF noise is a major problem for all analog electronics. Um, and, and the reason I latched onto this was when I was designing analog preamplifiers and power amplifiers. And in the early 1980s, my hi fi system was um, very variable. And it would sound at its best at 2 o'clock in the morning when all the lights in the house were switched off. Um, and some days the system would sound really good, and on other days the system would just sound horrible, just bright and aggressive. And in, in those days, somebody started talking about solid core mains cables. And I thought, this is a bit strange, solid core mains cables making a difference to the sound. This, this, this cannot be. But I thought, OK, let's make up a set of solid core mains cables. It's easy to do. Plugged it in, and indeed, it made a big difference to the sound quality. Against a stranded sort of cable, the standard mains cable, things were warmer and darker and smoother. This was a big problem for me because the particular preamp I was using on it had three cascaded stages of regulators, each one giving you 70 dBs worth of, of rejection. The op amps I was using had 140 dBs worth of power supply rejection. So you're looking at an enormous amount of rejection in the audio bandwidth. So it made no sense that the mains cable, solid core against stranded, could make a difference to the sound. So I've kind of already said what the solution is. The problem was that the power supply rejection ratio was in the audio bandwidth. In the RF bandwidth, it's a different, different kettle of fish, different problem. So I thought maybe that, you know, the only thing that can make a difference is RF noise. It's changing the sound quality. So what I did was to develop an RF noise mains filter. Um, and this turned out to be a very complex project um, because I found that if you use an inductor and a capacitor, um, you then needed to use a smaller inductor and a smaller capacitor to go higher in frequency. And you had to cascade these, these filters together. And I started off at going from 100 kilohertz and ended up going up into hundreds of megahertz. And as I improved this filter, the sound quality got better. Then I, once I perfected this filter, I then did the listening test between the solid core cable and the stranded cable before it hit the filter. And you could hear no difference whatsoever between the solid core and the stranded. So it meant that solid core cables, the RF characteristics, was better. Um, and this was the reason for it. Then I had to figure out why random RF noise was the cause of the problem. And what it's down to is intermodulation distortion. And when you have random RF noise and you have your audio signal, the intermodulation distortion products that you get are inside the audio bandwidth and it's random. Um, so this creates extra noise that's within the audio bandwidth, but the key is the noise pumps up and down with the signal itself. Um, and this is a big problem, and it's called noise floor modulation. So noise floor modulation can cause a, a, you know, a big sound quality problem, so you need to remove the random RF noise. The key here is random RF noise. If it's a fixed switching frequency RF noise, it doesn't matter so much because the intermodulation products will be around the carrier frequency. It won't be in the audio bandwidth. But random noise is, 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 is the key. Um, and just going back to that um, RF filter that I had, then once I used the filters on all of my preamps and preamplifiers, the system was always sounding good, and I didn't need to turn off the lights and, and listen at 2 o'clock in the morning because uh, the random RF noise was being eliminated. So um, what's the subjective consequences of, of noise form modulation? 
So imagine you've got a rich sounding saxophone um, and noise is pumping up and down with the saxophone, which is what's going to happen with random RF noise. That rich, smooth sounding sax is now going to have a white noise contribution to the sound of the sax. That's going to make it sound brighter than it should do. The brain cannot separate out the sounds of this noise form modulation with the sound of the sax because they're completely in sympathy with one another. Sax increases in volume, the noise error increases in volume in a completely linear fashion. So now your timbre of a saxophone is brighter than it should be. So let's imagine now that we've got a, a saxophone and a piano playing together. Here you're going to get three different artifacts from your noise form modulation. You're going to get noise in tune with the piano or in sympathy with the piano. You're going to be making the piano sound brighter than it should do. You're going to get noise on the saxophone into making the saxophone sound brighter. You're also going to get a product of noise that's a mixture of the sound of the saxophone and the sound of the piano. What does that mean for the brain? Well, the brain function is to separate individual sounds out into individual entities. But you've got this confusing mixture of noise that's a mixture of the saxophone and the piano. And the brain can't make sense of that. So what happens is that your separation of instruments gets degraded. So that because you've got this component of the sound of the saxophone and the sound of the piano mixed in together. So your instrument separation and focus is being degraded. And that's a very important um, idea, instrument separation and focus. I should explain, instrument separation is obvious, it's just things sounding separate. Focus is about when you've got a very quiet instrument playing in the mix and it's a loud mix, a loud instrument comes in, that quiet instrument loses its focus when you've got noise form modulation. So the sound of quiet instruments is being swamped by the sound of loud instruments. When you've got zero noise form modulation, these quiet instruments are there in the mix and they're always there and you can always hear it. Like you can when you listen to a, a, a jazz in, in real life without any PAs. Um, so focus is a very important part of the instrument separation thing. <clears throat> so noise form modulation affects timbre variation. Um, it degrades instrument separation and focus, which is what I mentioned. If you reduce your random RF noise, it's going to improve your perception of instrument separation and focus. But things sound warmer and softer um, with it. Quite a lot warmer and quite a lot softer. Um, and some people actually prefer the sound of noise form modulation because it artificially enhances the sound. It sounds etched. Um, and it also, on your imagery point of view, when you listen to a live acoustic instrument, um, such, such as a cello, for example, when you, if I was sitting here playing a cello, um, it is not a sharp pinpoint imagery. It's slightly rounded. It's because the cello is a big instrument. Um, noise form modulation, when you have it, actually sharpens up, artificially sharp, sharpens up the imagery. So you get the impression that it's a sharper image than it actually is in reality. But you, so you then think, ah, I've got this noise form modulation, it's sharpening everything up, it's making it sound more crystalline, it's making it brighter, you think it's sounding more transparent. But it's not, it's just distortion that's, that's causing this issue. Now, the benefit of, of removing your, your noise form modulation, you can start to play at a louder volume level. And the other big benefit is these quiet instruments don't lose their focus and you can listen to quiet instruments 
And that's real transparency, not this artificial, artificially sweetened transparency. And another big issue is listening fatigue. Um, with noise soil modulation, you can listen for half an hour or so, and then you get tired. And you're getting tired because the brain is having to struggle to make sense of what the instruments are doing, because you've got this little crosstalk from one instrument to another instrument. And the brain has to work harder. And that's the cause of, of listening fatigue. So how much noise soil modulation can we perceive? The answer to that is, it doesn't matter how small the noise form modulation is, you can still hear it. Um, and it, it's got perceptual consequences. And by how small, I'm talking about extremely small levels. Um, hundreds and hundreds of dBs down. Um, and I, can, I know this because I can simulate in the digital domain and see particular errors and then listen to those errors as, 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 a, as a listening test. Um, so noise floor modulation that is well below measurable limits is audible. Um, and it's audible in terms of things sounding warmer and smoother. Um, this is why you can hear changes to cables in terms of their brightness, and yet detect zero measurable differences because the levels that you can perceive are ridiculously small. So how can these impossibly small errors be perceivable? Um, honest answer, I don't know. My guess is that the brain, when it's doing this processing of separating individual instruments out into individual entities, is using something called in maths autocorrelation function. A correlation function, if you have an infinite period of time, will resolve infinitely small errors in a, in a noisy signal. Um, so this is how I think that ultra-small signals, which is well below audibility, the brain is detecting due to this correlation function that, 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 that it's using. So RF characteristics of the digital cable can change RF noise levels. Uh, particularly if you're, they're not impedance matched. Um, and the RF noise currents entering the DAC ground plane is a major, major issue. And this is where the mechanism for noise from your source getting into the DAC, how that technical mechanism is, is occurring. It's current flow into the, into the product, into the ground plane. When that current goes into the ground plane and out through the mains connector, or the power supply section, it creates small voltage drops across the ground plane. The analog electronics sees these voltage drops. So it sees the noise um, as voltage drops on the ground plane, because no ground plane at RF frequencies is perfect. It's got a finite impedance, particularly when you're talking about gigahertz frequencies. So you're getting these tiny voltage drops on the ground plane due to the current that's flowing in, into the DAC that is creating your intermodulation distortion and that's creating your noise form modulation. It's what they call common mode RF current noise, or what I call current mode RF current noise. And this is current that flows in a loop. So it's from the mains, your source, the cable ground, DAC, and back into the mains. You must have a loop for current to flow. If there's no loop, current will not flow. Now you can reduce this current flow by using ferrites on your um, electrical connections um, because that improves the, increases the impedance. When you increase the impedance, you reduce the current flow. Um, you can, there's other ways of doing it. You can use battery operation. Um, if you're running completely on batteries, there's no way that the current can flow. Um, So there's another issue, and that's correlated RF noise. So what's correlated RF noise? The disadvantage we've got with, with digital signals is that um, it's known as, the encoding is known as two's two complement. And with two's complement, when you're at zero or slightly positive, all of the bits are zero and 
the LSB maybe one, for example. When it goes slightly negative, all of those bits flip over to, to all ones. So a slightly negative signal is all ones. A slightly positive signal or a zero signal is all zeros. When a processor is processing, taking the, 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 the music data out of memory, pumping it into the processor, manipulating it, and then pumping it to your, app, your USB outputs, this noise as it changes state is, is there as detectable noise. When the processor works on this, this information, you get a lot of burst of noise in the gigahertz region. Um, and it's correlated. It's got a relationship to the, to the signal. The problem is this noise is at its worst for very small signals. So when this correlated RF noise at gigahertz gets into the DAC, the analog circuitry will demodulate this, this noise, turn it into audio bandwidth noise. So you've now got audio bandwidth noise in the DAC that's corrupting your small signals. And this will make the small signal slightly bigger or slightly smaller than it should be. And what this does is degrade your perception of depth. Um, and um, depth is something that is, a, again, really, really important um, to me because that's something you don't hear with reproduced audio. If you listen to um, an organ in a cathedral and it's 200 feet away, it sounds 200 feet away. If you listen it on a set of headphones, there's no way it sounds anything like 200 feet away. So improving the perception of depth is, is my number one biggest challenge. And one of the things I found is that if you have a very tiny degradation in small signal amplitude, it will degrade your perception of depth. So these little tiny signals that are correlated to small signals in the digital domain will degrade your perception of depth. So what can we do about correlated RF noise? If you use a low power processor, um, that's going to reduce the noise. Um, so a mobile phone is going to be better than a big processor in a, in a large computer. Don't discount your mobile phone as the best source you can get for several reasons. One is it's battery operated. We cannot get current flowing in a, in a battery operated source. Um, it's very low power. So the amount of a gigahertz processing noise is intrinsically low. So this will actually kill two birds with one stone. Um, you're going to eliminate the correlated RF noise issue, and you're going to eliminate the random noise floor modulation problem as well. So you're going to end up with much better depth reprodu reproduction and a smoother, more natural, warmer sound. Things are going to sound more rounded and less impressive, but they're going to be much fundamentally better. So optical. Um, which is something that has the reputation of being the worst sounding digital connection when it's actually the best sounding digital connection. Optical has perfect isolation because the interface coupling capacitance is zero. Um, everything's done by light, there's no, no coupling capacitance. Um, that eliminates correlated RF noise from the interface, degrading sound stage depth, and it eliminates random RF noise getting into the DAC, so you're going to get a warmer sound quality. Downside to optical is that it often has worse jitter, um, but on my old um, ATS2 audio precision, the optical connection gave lower measured jitter levels than the BNC, so it, it often depends upon your actual implementation. Um, but generally speaking, Optical is slightly worse jitter. Jitter is not an issue with my DAX at all because of the way that the digital phase lock loop works and the fact that the clocks are being used and nothing to do with your source clock. Toslink against USB. Um, so optical should be considered as your reference connection. So if you want to find out which is the best connection, 
use optical to a reference. USB can sound identical to optical, um, which proves that the USB implementation, if, if you've got the correct source, is perfectly, perfectly okay. Um, if you run it with a low powered source and it's battery operated, you're pretty much guaranteed that USB is going to sound the same as optical. Um, I had a, an old MSI laptop which had optical outputs built into the, into the unit and it had USB and that laptop I could hear no difference whatsoever between um, USB and, and optical. On the other hand, uh, I've got the same situation on my MS, MSI motherboard for my design computer which is a huge computer, very advanced processor and you can hear substantial differences between the optical and the BNC. Um, so uh, this is because it's simply that much more powerful and much more noisier. Um, so you're okay if your source is low powered and battery operated. In my listening tests with USB cables, um, generally high-end USB cables are actually designed to make the sound brighter by increasing RF noise. Um, USB cables is actually a very complex um, situation in terms of design work. Um, it costs an awful lot of money to design a USB cable um, and it takes a lot of time to test it and certify it. So the good audiophile USB cables sound identical to a standard generic USB um, cable. Um, a bad audiophile cable, which is creating more RF noise, will sound brighter and actually will be worse. Um, optical cables, um, doesn't matter what type, whether you're using glass or using plastic fibre, so long as it works at 192 kilohertz, they sound the same. Again, the caveat is that this is with my DAX. Um, if you've got a DAC that's sensitive to source jitter, it could be a completely different, different scenario. Right, this is the most contentious um, issue and the, and the one that people will be throwing rotten tomatoes at me with. Linear power supplies are the best power supplies. Not. It's funny, linear power supplies, because I just don't understand why people assume that switch mode power supplies are worse than linear. Um, I think a lot of it is down to the idea of it's switching, therefore it must be bad. Um, I sympathise with that view because when I designed the DAC64 I used linear regulators all the time. I didn't want to use um, switching regulators because I thought it's going to sound worse. Um, I had a big surprise when I designed Hugo, Hugo 1, because this is battery operated and it must use um, switch mode power supplies internally because of power efficiency reasons. Um, and um, what I did was I, I compared the sound of the linear regulator to this switch mode power supply regulators. I got a huge surprise because I thought it was going to sound worse. They actually sounded considerably better. The switch switching regulator was warmer and smoother and sounded like it had no RF noise. Um, that was, it turned out to be for two reasons. One is with, with switches you're forced to use RF filters and you use RF filters at the beginning of the regulator and RF filters at the end of the regulator. Um, I always used RF filters on my linear regulators anyway, but with switches you go to a higher level of, of, of degree. The other issue is that imagine you've got a noisy source. Let's say the, the, the current is one amp for, for, you know, just to give you a number. And that one amp is RF noise worth of current. If you put that through a linear regulator, then it will go from one volt, say, to five volts. Going out of the five volts is still going to be one amp of noisy current going through it. If you put it into a switcher, you'll have 
200 milliamps of current flowing out of the 5 volt supply because, of course, it's completely efficient. Um, so how that noise is propagating through the rest of the system, switches are actually a, a considerable benefit because they, they maintain the power levels, they're efficient. So getting back to linear power supplies. Um, I get into a lot of trouble when I, when, I, when I say switch mode power supplies are perfectly fine and then don't ignore, um, ignore um, you know, that the, the, the linears are actually worse. The technical facts are quite different. So uh, let's go through the actual um, technical facts. Firstly, what do we want from an ideal power supply? What would be the ideal? power supply. One thing, we need zero random RF noise. We've talked about noise form modulation, so it needs to be zero. Um, we also need, with amplifiers with significant power output, zero output impedance in the audio bandwidth. Why do we need zero output impedance? This is because um, with a normal audio amplifier, it uses push-ball output stage. So you've got a positive rail, you've got a negative rail. Um, when the signal goes positive, it's drawing current from the positive rail. When it's going negative, it's drawing current from the negative rail. If that current is, is going through a finite impedance, you'll get a voltage drop. That voltage drop is highly distorted. It's either there when it's positive or it's negative. And that will create distortion problems within, measurable distortion problems within your amplification stage. If your power supply has zero impedance, there will be zero voltage drop, zero errors. So you won't have any of this, this power supply induced distortion. Um, power supply is actually very, very complex in terms of how they interrelate with the audio amplified electronics. And this is giving you a flavor of, of that complexity. Um, linear power supplies do not have RF filters built into it. So they're going to let the random RF noise from the mains, and there's huge amounts of random RF noise from the mains, all the way through, um, it's going to be unaffected. Unregulated linear power supplies have got another problem, and that is Ripple. And Ripple is, um, in the US, 60 hertz related mains, um, and it turns into a little triangle wave when it, when it gets rectified and on, on a capacitor. That ripple on a power amplifier will be a few volts, um, depending on your, your value of, of capacitance. But the thing about this um, noise, or this distortion, is that if there's no signal, your ripple level is very low. When the signal gets larger, your ripple level gets larger. And that ripple get, will feed through the power amplifier and create an output error. And you can see this measurable stereophile do measurements of, of power amplifiers and they do a one kilohertz tone and you can see everything down to DC and you can see all the ripple harmonics. Um, the best power supply would have zero ripple harmonics and this low frequency grunge that is dependent on your music power envelope is very, very audible. It softens up the bass um, and you lose bass definition. Um, so again, your ideal power supply would, would have no ripple on it at all. Regulated linear power supplies still have significant amounts of, of, of ripple coming through. Um, switch mode power supplies always have RF filters built in, and they have to do that to meet EMC requirements. And there will be RF filters on the mains input and RF filters on the output. Fixed frequency switching is not a major issue. Um, I, when COVID was going on, I decided to run some SPICE modeling. Now, SPICE model is a, an analog simulator, so you can um, work out how much rejection a particular filter has got in, in analog terms. And I decided, right, I want to build a filter that eliminates random RF noise. Um, and the random RF noise was from DC up to 10 gigahertz 
And I also want to build a filter that will eliminate switch mode switching noise. And by eliminate, I'm talking about picovolts coming out, um, so completely eliminating it. Doing it, and my spice modeling included the capacitance, the resistance inside the capacitance, the inductors inside the capacitance, the PCB trace impedance, I modeled all of those things as well. Um, eliminating the fixed frequency signal was very easy to do. You could do it with a simple inductor and a, and, and a capacitor, and you, you'd end up with a two-stage filter, you'd end up with picovolts worth of level. Random noise was almost impossible to eliminate. It, uh, particularly when you, when you started worrying about 10 gigahertz. Um, you had to use a very complex filtering structure to, to get your random noise down to, to picovolts. That was a really interesting um, project in it. And it showed why, when I mentioned earlier about the 1980s, why I was using these cascading filters. Well, in my case, I did it by listening. So I chose an inductor, chose a capacitor, chose the next inductor, chose the next capacitor, and just listened to the ones that, that gave the best performance. And it ended up being a 12th order, very complex filter. And I ended up making, winding my own coils for the gigahertz, or the tens of megahertz to gigahertz frequencies, air-cooled coils with PTFE insulation, um, and polystyrene cement to, to, to get them all together. And this, ex this modeling that I was doing was replicating exactly what I was doing in, in the 1980s, which was really interesting in, in, in terms of agreeing with what I discovered subjectively. The other issue with um, switch mode power supplies is efficiency. A project I'm working on at the moment, it requires 75 amps at one volt. The input to this device is 24 volts. If I was doing that with linears, you would need a 1.8 kilowatt power continuous power dissipation in the device. That's clearly impossible. It would glow in the dark. Um, and that noise would just feed through and onto the main system. So my switch mode um, design is only 80 watts um, in terms of actual, actual performance. You get less noise, less heat, and a clearly a greener solution. So linear power supplies are non-linear in that they create distortion. There's no RF noise um, filters, so you're going to get measurable noise form modulation. And even if you didn't have measurable noise form modulation, you're still going to have noise form modulation, which you can perceive but can't measure. Because any noise form modulation has audible consequences. They create signal-related hum harmonics, um, which is very, very audible. Um, and the other issue with a large toroidal transformer, apart from the fact they buzz and create vibration, they create large external magnetic fields, which is signal dependent. And those magnetic fields are picked up by sensitive analog electronics, and you're getting another source of errors coming through. Switch mode power supplies don't have that issue um, because you use very small transformers. The stray magnetic field is, is, is much, much lower. So what is the best power supply possible? For power amps, the car battery <coughs> is the best power supply. Um, 300 amps, sub milli ohms impedance, very, very fast, no RF noise if you screen it, um, complete isolation from the mains, um, and 300 amps capacity. So you can draw down enormous amounts of current at a very fast rate. Um, low power DAC amps, when you don't need 300 amps, Lithium ion batteries are also ideal. You do have to worry about the impedance of a lithium ion battery, um, but that's another, that's, that's another issue, and that's something you can design around. When I do my listening tests against the power supply, it needs to be compared against battery operation. Um, for low power lithium ion is fine, but for power amplifiers, it needs to be compared against battery. 
If your switch mode power supply sounds identical to a car battery, it's the perfect power supply. Now the issue here is, if you add a linear supply to this, it's going to change the sound quality. It's going to make it sound brighter. It's going to make it sound crystalline. It's going to make the edges sound sharper. You're going to be fooled into thinking it's better when it's not better. It's, it's actually a lot, a lot worse. Um, the way of detecting whether it's better is going back to the instrument separation and the focus part and listening fatigue. Um, listening fatigue is, 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 is the big killer. So, power supplies inside a DAC amp is very complex um, and a lot depends upon um, internal regulation, RF filtering that you're building into, into the design. The power supply solution needs to be considered with the DAC amp in mind. So what will work in one situation won't work in another situation. Um, and it, you have to have a holistic system approach. Um, but battery operation is always the ideal and the power supply needs to be measured or listened to against batteries. So now we're entering into less contentious areas, um, passive components. Um, I'm probably preaching to the converted here because most people believe that passive components can have a difference to the sound quality. Particularly if you actually spend time listening. It's the people that never listen that think the passive components cannot possibly make a difference to the sound quality. Um, very small errors, well below the threshold of hearing, can have an impact that's audible. Um, as these errors, as I've talked earlier, interfere with the brain's processing. And it, it's this that correlation, autocorrelation issue I was talking about. Um, I've talked about RF noise and noise floor modulation being important. The other aspect that applies to passive components is small signal amplitude and phase nonlinearity. What do I mean by that? Imagine we have a signal at minus 60 dB and then we make that signal minus 120 dB um, and measure the amplitude. Um, what will happen inside a real product or a DAC is that your minus 120 dB won't be minus 120 dB, it'll be minus 121 um, or minus 119. There'll be an amplitude error. There'll also be a phase error. So that if you did the phase shift at minus 60 dB and then measure the phase shift at minus 120 dB, um, it can be different. These two effects, a phase shift with amplitude and your amplitude not being correct, has a big impact in terms of sound quality, in terms of depth perception. So how do I know this is important? Um, going to um, Dave, when I, when I was developing Dave, um, the benefit I've got is that I can measure things in the digital domain, and I can measure down to minus 400 dB. Um, it's the nature of the device. You can never measure it in real life, but, but you can take a digital data, process it, and then do FFT on that digital data. So you, you're getting the exact performance. And you might see errors at minus 300 dB or, or whatever, and then you could actually do a listening test when those errors are being removed. So you can quantify what you're hearing against ridiculously small values. When I was um, playing around with Dave, I had, um, at that time, my noise shapers were 200 dB performing noise shapers. This means distortion and noise in the audio bandwidth for the noise shaper is at minus 200 dB. It also means that if your signal is below minus 200 dB, the noise shaper will not resolve it. It cannot see it, it cannot detect it, you're going to lose that signal. Any signals below minus 200 dB is being lost. That's the nature of, of, of how noise shapers function. I thought at that time that 200 dB was a perfectly good number. Because that's a thousand times better than traditional noise shapers. Most noise shapers work at 140 dB. 
But thinking about things and making assumptions is the wrong way to approach things. You need to do a listening test to find out whether things are better or not. And I had this brand new FPGA with loads of capacity um, with Dave. So I then um, tried to make the noise shaper better, just to see whether um, this thing would make any difference. So I started with 220 and listened to it. Nothing changed. It sounded absolutely identical, except for depth. With depth, with the 220dB noise shaper, um, distant um, instruments sounded more distant. And I've got particular test tracks that I use just to measure the sound quality of, of, of depth. And I kept doing this process and improving the noise shaper until I ended up with 350 dB performance. And even going from 330 dB to 350 dB, you could still hear a change. Now these numbers are ridiculously small. 350 dB is an incredibly tiny number and it's, it makes no sense to me that these things are perceivable. But you can only go on, on what you can hear and if I do this as a blind listening test, which I have done, you can still perceive these changes. Um, so the outcome of all this is the amplitude and phase of tiny signals needs to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, you'll hear a change in, 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 in depth perception. Now, with analog components, you can get small signal errors in the same way that you can get it with, with noise shakers. And this happens with um, contacts, metal to metal transitions, solder joints, and copper. Copper oxide is a diode. Uh, in fact, the old um, early radios used copper oxide to, to, to make your crystal set. It was the crystal was copper oxide. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's dioding. Um, what it means is your impedance for small signals is different to the impedance for large signals. Exactly the same that we have with noise shapers. Small signals aren't being resolved accurately compared to large signals. So any metal-to-metal -metal interfaces you have to worry about, and crystal boundaries, you have to worry about purity, you have to worry about surface oxides. Um, these things will make a difference to the sound quality. Even soldered joints can make a difference. Um, different types of solder has remarkably different properties. So um, silver solder sounds better than normal tin lead solder. Um, and again, it's all down to the purity of the solder. Resistors. Leaded resistors um, have much poorer sound quality. They are inductive because the way that they the leaded resistors are made is it's a ceramic body and then a metal film is encoded as a spiral um, onto, onto it and then it's trimmed and that spiral is an inductor. In fact, any physical length of a track is inductance. So one millimeter is one main Henry worth of inductance, roughly as a, as a, as a rough number. So RF resonances and within a resistor is going to increase RF noise. They're also capacitive. When it goes across the, 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 the trap, you get this capacitance. So a resistor is a combination of resistance, um, self-inductance, and, and capacitance. The other issue is they have push-fit contacts. So they make the ceramic body, and then they just squeeze on a tin connector. Um, and uh, then there's the leaded wires coming out. That squeezed on tin connection degrades your depth and detail resolution because it's a poor quality contact. It's not gold plated, it's just a tin plated contact. So you can have an amplifier product that's full of gold plated connectors, but all the internal connections on your resistors are just cheap tin plated um, contacts. Surface mount resistors are much, much better. They don't have internal contacts. The um, contact body is plated directly um, onto the surface itself. The inductance is very, very low, much, much lower, and the, the capacitance is, is much lower. And you can use very, very small devices. 
So surface mount resistors with everything else being equal sounds better than leaded resistors because of these, these issues that I've talked about. Some resistors are non-linear. Um, carbon composition, for example, is, is the obvious one. So it's got a voltage coefficient. But you know you don't buy those today. Um, but uh, linearity of voltage coefficient is, an, is a very small issue. All resistors have dynamic self-heating issues. So what happens here, the signal goes through the resistor, the resistor gets warm. You know, it might be only be half a degree C, but the temperature coefficient of the resistance means the resistance value will change. So you've got the power envelope of the signal modulating the sound. So you've got amplitude modulation effects going on. That is actually surprisingly quite audible. Um, so that's, a, that's another problem you have to worry about with, with resistors. Capacitors. Capacitors have got internal inductance, particularly in the film and foil um, and electrolytics. That's a problem for RF noise. Um, and it's also a problem if you've got a big electrolytic and you're trying to decouple things at 20 kilohertz, it's not going to work because the impedance at 20 kilohertz is too high. Capacitors have something called dielectric absorption. Um, particularly so with um, tantalums and electrolytics. What's dielectric absorption? This is where you charge a capacitor up. Charges migrate to the surface of the device, stay on the surface of the device. When you discharge the capacitor, the charges on the surface of the device are still there and they don't discharge. They take a longer time to discharge and that creates an error and that error is very audible. It's why electrolytic capacitors and tantalum capacitors sound warm and soft in the base because of this error that's been, being generated. You're not going to measure it because it's a dynamic issue. When they do measurements, it is a s steady sine wave. Dielectric absorption will turn out to be a DC offset problem. It won't turn out into a, a, a real problem. It's a dynamic issue, dynamic error. Um, all coupling capacitors affect sound quality. Um, you can't escape that because of all these issues I've talked about. Analog DC servos still have capacitors inside the signal loop and they still change the sound quality. Um, the only solution to this is my digital DC servo, um, which removes any audible component um, digitally. And so you end up with a trim that just trims out DC offsets. The downside is it takes a long time to do the trim properly, which is why when you turn on a Moto 2, it takes 16 seconds before the trim is being nulled out, because that's the way the, the thing is working. Inductors. Um, inductors are nasty devices um, that you shouldn't use in the audio signal path at all, um, particularly ferrite core inductors. They have an inductance that varies with current. What this does is it creates a nasty form of distortion um, because your inductance changes with signal amplitude. What this means is your phase will then change with signal amplitude because your inductance value is changing. Um, and that means you've got transient timing errors coming through. Um, and that is very, very audible. So you should never use inductors in the signal path or ferrite bees in the, in the signal path um, because of, of, of this issue. So every metal-to-metal -metal interface is audible. You need to keep your analog as simple as possible um, for transparency. Um, solder is very important. Any surface oxides it, it, it is, is a problem. Choices for passive components can be difficult because you've got differing requirements. You may be worrying about RF noise or you may be worrying about dielectric absorption and there's not an ideal solution to, to, to both in, in, in that, that factors. Finally, never assume. Um, and this is something I've always, always tried to do. Never make assumptions. You've got to do listening tests to determine whether your assumptions are, are valid or not. The best kind of listening tests are ones when you can hear no difference um, when you've changed an error, because then you know you've hit the, the bottom of the bucket 
and there's no question about interpreting the error. If you can't hear a change, you can't hear a change. Um, and I'll be talking about how to objectively listen to things tomorrow. So that's any questions. And please don't throw tomatoes at me for you know, power supplies. Yes. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. It's excellent. Absolutely great. Um, uh, on your passive components, um, are you, um, it's the resistors and the capacitors, uh, are they the ones which are uh, uh, changing the phase, the shift, the phase shift? Um, what's, what's happening? What's so the phase, the phase shift issue will happen with inductors. Yes. Um, or rather, they will happen with ferrite ah, those inductors. Air-cooled inductors are OK, because they're perfectly linear. The downside to an air core inductor is that they can pick up noise, magnetic noise from, from other components. Um, the self-inductance in a capacitor is linear, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, the worry you have to worry about is if the capacitance value itself changes, because that will change your phase. Um, and if your resistance value changes in your RC circuit, that will change the phase as well. Um, so if that changes dynamically, you're, you're, you're in trouble. Another, just another question. Uh, you talked about uh, the, the great things about using batteries. Yes. Um, I know, this is a silly question, but uh, your small components obviously have batteries, but something like a Dave doesn't have a battery. No. Right? So what, what went through your mind, whether you should put a battery in it or not? Um, a battery in Dave is a good idea. <laughs> I know, I know one guy has developed a 120 volt battery, which he then feeds into the mains input, because apparently the DC, the switcher can respond to DC, because it just rectifies it and then, then, then uses it. And he's saying he's getting really good results with that. So um, yeah, Dave, um, if I was designing Dave today, I wouldn't design it the way I've done it. Yeah, because... Uh because well, that's, well, that's 2015. That's right. <laughs> so you go for that. What, uh, what we're finding um, like from California, a lot of the appliances that now, because of the PV systems and the battery storage, we're putting 24 volts or 48 volts straight in. Oh, in wow. House. So you've got appliances now which are generating DC offsets. That's right. Yeah. They go to DC. That's so going to make, that's, that's make Toroidal transformers buzz like hell. Because it's, it's DC that causes the, the, the buzzes on toroidal transformers. You know when you get a toroidal yeah. transformer and it starts buzzing? Yeah. It's DC offsets that cause it. Because I, 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 when I used to buy my transformers from a toroidal company, yeah. um, he made his stuff and I said, why the hell do your bloody transformers buzz sometimes and not buzz other times? And he said, it's DC. Yeah. Yes. Also really liked your talk. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Um, when you think about using switch mode power supplies in a source, like a computer, and you're hooking up via USB, obviously you're going to have some of that, you know, the ones to zeros creating noise, noise. noise. Yeah, it goes in. Um, like, are you better off air gapping even the USB connection if you can have like fiber over USB or something like that? Like how yes. do you mitigate? Yes, that fi fiber over, over USB. But I'm not 100% convinced about fiber over USB because they often transmit power down the cable. So they have boxes now, so I can hook one box to a battery so, at the end point. So, 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 long, so long as it's, it's not physically, the grounds and, and power supply aren't being connected, you're fine. Um, but um, if it's got the ones that transmit a cable with the fiber optic, there's no benefit because you're, you're, st you're still going to cut through from the electrical connection. Got it. And by, by the same token, similar question, the phone, like my iPhone into a, you know... One thing that you could use is, yeah. is the USB to optical um, converters. Yeah, exactly. That was my next question. The, the, the ones that don't have separate power supplies, that are fed directly from your USB-C um, power, you know, from the computer. They work perfectly fine. Um, now, the ones that they're using separate supplies, you're in trouble with because it, it, what I've been talking about here is, is a little bit more complicated because you can have 
mains loops flowing. So if you've got an external a computer and then a, a, a digital digital product that's power supplied by the mains, you're going to get a mains loop flowing around that and that thing. If the DAC um, intersects that mains loop, then it will see the voltage and, and cause problems within the DAC. Um, so if you if it's powered from the from the thing, there's only one connection. There's, there's no no local loops being created. So so by the same token, Mojo Two battery powered, iPhone battery powered. I can have a little USB connection between the both. That's that's perfectly fine. That will be the same as going having an optical USB to yes. optical yeah. converter. Yeah. Right, I, 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 optical I, I, every listening test I've ever done, they just sound the same. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's current that's causing the problem. If there's no current flowing, there's no voltage differentials, no voltage drops on the ground plane. If we had perfect ground planes, there wouldn't be an issue. But perfect ground planes are impossible to do, particularly when you're worrying about 10 gigahertz. Last question. We have these you know, lithium phosphate batteries hooked up to inverters. Yeah. And the inverters, let's say it feeds my headphone. Um, and the headphone amp has a linear power supply. Mm -hmm. Am I still going to encounter uh, these RF issues? Yes. Yeah, because the, 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 the inverters are still powered um, and they're not RF filtered. And if you want to eliminate random RF noise, you need to have extremely complex RF filters to, to eliminate that. That, that. that was my spice modeling. That, that's what told me that you know to, to eliminate Random RF noise, you must have extremely complicated filters. This power quality sucks in New York. Um, yeah. Like, I've, I've picked up radio signals. I'm afraid I'm going to have to go because it's the next, next seminar is going to be starting. Sorry, so I'll be happy to talk to anybody outside if, if you want to continue this, this conversation. So thank you, everybody. Oh, well. I forgot to say thank you for coming, but I've joined normally at the beginning.